Well, hi everyone. It's Heidi with the APS. So great to see you. Uh, uh, happy New Year to you all and very happy to see you here on Stamp Chat. Today's guest joins us from New York. Matt and Matarasi inherited the joy of stamp collecting from his grandparents in Iran. Ever since his favorite hobby has been collecting and studying their designs to learn about the history and culture of where they were issued. He's also written about the politics of stamp design. That's why we're here tonight. And his research has been published by Harvard's Journal of Cold War Studies and the Wilson Center Think Tank. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society with over 28,000 members across the world. It is the largest philatelic organization. Whether you're a seasoned or novice collector, we have the resources to meet your needs. Memberships, membership benefits include a monthly subscription to the American Philatelist, be it digital or hard copy, access to the American Philatelic Research Library, discounts on expertizing services, and of course, so much, much more. Visit stamps.org to find out about the great member, ser member services available to you and join today. Now, before we begin, friends, we have a few housekeeping items to cover. Uh, today is a webinar, and as such, all cameras are off and your mics are muted respectively. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box for our friends that are joining us online. Go ahead and use that uh, liberally. And if you'd like to engage with Mateen, uh, please go ahead and use the Q&A box. This webinar is being recorded and you can find it on our APS YouTube channel. So be sure to like and subscribe and you can continue to keep the conversation going there in the comment box. And with that, I present Mr. Matarasi, the role of stamps in U.S. foreign relations. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Heidi, and hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So this morning, when I was practicing my presentation, I, I realized something, which was that when I first started working on this, it was in November, right after the, the, the elections. And at the time, I thought to myself, let me start the presentation with something that's going on in the news right now, thinking that you know, in two months, of course, everyone's gonna remember what was going on. And here we are two months later and the election seems like ages ago, but I'm gonna ask everyone to try to think back to November, um, try to think back to those couple of weeks right after the election and um, try to remember how the biggest topic in the news at the time was this question of when certain government agencies were going to start working with the president elect releasing funds, offering certain resources to the new administration. And one of the big debates on CNN and other news channels was this question of whether the president-elect would be given access to high-level intelligence briefings. Uh, the same, his, same as his predecessors, you know, including the, president, the current president, the same way they were uh, offered these briefings after they were, um, after they were elected. And one of the terms that was often used in these debates and in these newspaper articles was the president's daily brief. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, the president's daily brief is a top secret report that is written for the president and his senior national security advisors almost every day. It includes everything from details of CIA covert operations to significant geopolitical developments from around the world. Basically everything the commander in chief needs to know in order to carry out his or her responsibilities. So a few years ago, the CIA actually declassified a bunch of these reports from the 1960s and 70s. And I pick one out for you. Um, this is from back when they were known as the president's intelligence checklist. Um, and this particular one is from January, 1963. It was 10 pages long. It included everything from maps. This one, um, you can see it has, it says possible area of guerrilla incursion, um, as well as these short summaries of important events. And one of them immediately caught my eye. It said, the Hungarians have issued a series of stamps honoring Soviet and US astronauts, but quickly withdrew from circulation the one honoring Carpenter. So Scott Carpenter was the second American to orbit the earth. It seems he was put on the one with the highest denomination, which was taken to imply US superiority. Hungarian philatelists are having a field day. 
So these are the stamps that it was referring to. Um, as you can see, uh, eventually these stamps were um, apparently reissued simply in the order in which the astronauts travel to space. But the question that I immediately had when I read this was, there, there are two questions. One was, why does the president of the United States, um, someone with access to the most powerful military in the world, need to know about stamps? And the second question, an equally interesting question is, why did the CIA analyst, who probably had access to much more sophisticated sources, think that the designs on stamps could potentially provide insight into another country's politics? So these are the two questions that will guide uh, tonight's presentation. And um, what I did was I started digging around for other intelligence reports dating back to the Cold War that mentioned stamps. And I found a couple interesting examples that I would like to share with you all. So I want to say from the beginning that you are, please, please don't try to read this report from your screen. Uh, I, I, that's almost impossible. I know the font is very small. I'm going to be zooming in on the parts that I think are interesting. If anyone wants to read one of these reports, please simply send me an email and I would be more than happy to send you the PDF. Um, and my email address is just my first name dot last name at gmail.com. So here is another CIA report and um, I am going to zoom in on the title. And it reads, belief that communists are using von Schill postage stamp in propaganda effort to foster German nationalistic feeling against France. So this report was referring to this East German stamp. And it features someone named Ferdinand von Schill, who was a Prussian soldier who led an uprising against Napoleon's forces in the early 19th century. And what the report basically says is that this stamp could have been part of a larger um, campaign by the East German government to create resentment and anger towards the French for the same reason that governments do similar things today, which is that if citizens are angry at an outside group, they're not blaming the government for their problems. But the reason this was significant was because around that time, France was debating whether to join the European defense community, which basically called for a pan-European defense force drawn from um, contributions from, from different member states, including West Germany. So if obviously, if you're a French policymaker at that time, your main concern is whether rearming Germany is going to lead to a repeat of history. And it was precisely this fear that led to France refusing to ratify the treaty just four months after this report was written. Here is another CIA report from 1967, and I'm going to zoom in on the title. It says, East German postage stamps honor Rota Capella agents. So Rota Capella uh, was the German name given by the Gestapo to an anti-Nazi resistance movement during World War II. And here are the stamps themselves. And what the report basically said was that some of the people on these stamps had relatives or associates living in the US. And that if this was a reflection of how prominent or well-respected they were within the East German government, then a copy of this memo should also be sent to the FBI for counterintelligence purposes. Here is a letter sent by the Hungarian ambassador, um, or rather the US ambassador in Hungary to the CIA director in 1986. And it tells the CIA director that Hungary had just issued a stamp commemorating the, um, the space shuttle Challenger um, after, after the, the explosion that claimed the lives of the astronauts. And the ambassador says, as far as I know, this gesture is unique within Eastern Europe and was certainly an act which crossed ideological barriers. And the ambassador included a first day cover of this stamp. And you can see the names of the astronauts on the left. And one more that I wanna show you. This is a State Department airgram. So two things. Number one, I took this picture on my cell phone six years ago 
long before I ever imagined in my wildest imagination that I will be presenting it to uh, a, a group of philatelists publicly. So apologies for the quality of the scan. Um, secondly, an airgram, for those of you who are not familiar, is simply a, a diplomatic communication that is sent via the diplomatic bag as opposed to by telegram. And I'm gonna zoom in on the title. This is from 1965, and it's, it's from the US Embassy in Kigali in Rwanda. And it says, pro-West policy of GOR, government of Rwanda, indicated in postage stamps. And it's referring to these stamps, which I'm about to show you. The, the message says, the embassy has been struck by the number of American themes on Rwandan postage stamps issued recently. A few weeks ago, a series of stamps in five denominations was issued on the 100th centennial of the death of Abraham Lincoln. This week, a series of Telstar and Syncom have appeared in two denominations each. So those are two um, US communication satellites. So as stamp collectors, we hear this or, or we read this and we sort of scratch our heads, right? I mean, I can certainly think of another reason why Rwanda might issue space themed stamps. And that's less to do with the staff of the US embassy and more to do with us collectors. So why, why did the US embassy write such a document? Well, there are two possibilities. Number one, honestly, it could have just been a slow news day in Rwanda, and they just wanted to have something to write to show that they, they were doing their work. Or they could have been remembering the way that stamps have also been used by the US government to promote its foreign policy goals. And that's what I want to turn to right now. One of the best examples of this thing that I just mentioned is the stamps that the US issued commemorating NATO. So the US was one of the founding members of NATO in 1949. And a lot of Americans disagreed with the decision to join NATO because they thought that that would lead to the US getting involved in unnecessary wars. Just three years after the US joined NATO, the US issued this stamp. And as you can imagine, many people did not appreciate the close connection um, between the president's policy initiative and, and the design of a stamp that they had to see all the time in, in their mail. One presidential candidate criticized the stamp as a slick way to put Ike in everyone's mailbox. Ike was of course Dwight Eisenhower, who was the Republican candidate for president and had been serving as Supreme Allied Commander for, for NATO. And um, I love this, this next quote, we Democrats can lick the NATO stamp now and the Republican party in November. And a lot of people also noticed that whenever they went to the post office to buy stamps, their only option was to buy the NATO stamp. Here's one person who wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper, excuse me, to the editor of a newspaper in Pennsylvania, complaining that whenever they went to the post office, they would notice that the stamps, instead of having the familiar, honest American face of Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, have the letters NATO on them. And eventually the post office admitted that they had deliberately removed the other stamps from sale for a period of six months in order to promote and publicize NATO with the American public, adding that they hoped that people would use the stamp on mail sent abroad so that, quote, it would demonstrate to the people of those countries that the United States is behind NATO. So just seven years later, the US issued another stamp to commemorate NATO's 10th anniversary. Ask yourself, when was the last time the US honored two anniversaries within seven years of each other? During the first day ceremony, the postmaster general said that he hoped that, quote, more of our citizens will be made aware, end quote, of NATO's importance for peace and security. For NATO's 25th anniversary, the US, the post office decided to issue a NATO themed aerogram. So I did not know what an aerogram was before I, I learned about this. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, it's basically a piece of paper that you can fold up in the shape of an envelope. And before the post office publicly announced this, they first told the State Department that they were gonna do this. And the State Department, the DC headquarters, sent this cable asking their office in Brussels where NATO was, is headquartered um, so that they could ask other NATO countries if they wanted to do something similar. And as many of you probably remember, 
It was only in 1999 that the US issued yet a fourth item commemorating NATO, this one for NATO's 50th anniversary. And in just three years, 2024, uh, the NATO's 75th anniversary will be coming up. So I'm, I'm sure we're all eager to see what the post office will, will, be, will be doing. So I want to talk about one more stamp series that has this close connection with US foreign policy. And just by way of background, in 1957, the Postmaster General, partially in response to criticism that some of the designs on the recent stamps had been kind of silly or they weren't really representative of American culture and society, um, he decided to appoint a committee called the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee to not only set standards for what should appear on US stamps, but to also recommend the actual designs. And so he appointed seven people. Three of them were prominent philatelists and three others were uh, well-known, well-respected designers and artists. And one was a representative from, an, from a US government agency called the United States Information Agency, which was basically the public relations arm of the US government. These were the people who ran Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, uh, among other things. At the same time, just a few years before that, President Eisenhower had set up something called the Operations Coordinating Board, uh, which later became part of the National Security Council. Basically, its job was to coordinate national security policies among multiple agencies. And it included high-level officials from the CIA, Defense Department, State Department, as well as a representative from the US Information Agency. So, in fact, it was, it was often the same person who attended both of these committee meetings. So I went and searched for minutes of the operations coordinating board and I found some very interesting stuff. Here's one of them. It is from 1959 and it's signed by CIA director Alan Dulles. And uh, they're talking about who to select for the Champions of Liberty series. Um, I, I don't generally like to read off of slides verbatim, but I, I think this one is worth it, so please bear with me. The board discussed at considerable length the number of possible choices for individuals to be honored in the Champions of Liberty commemorative stamp series. Discussion centered particularly on Ernst Reuter, late mayor of West Berlin. A number of members of the group felt that Reuter would be an admirable choice at any time, but that he might be a particularly good one during this period of tension over the Berlin situation. So what Director Dulles is talking about is the Soviet Union had given an ultimatum demanding the withdrawal of Western armed forces from West Berlin. So that's the, that's the Berlin situation. It was agreed that the USIA representative on the panel, considering individuals to be so honored, would submit Reuters name, but that if there was determined opposition from other sources, he should not insist to the bitter end. So I just, I think that it's the, the context in which stamps are being discussed is pretty amazing. And I deliberately cropped this image a little farther down than I usually would. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to show how the, how the second item on the agenda that day, well, the first one was, was the Champions of Liberty stamps. And the second one was the deployment of missiles to West Germany. And I'm sure everyone listening to this presentation agrees with the order in which those two things were prioritized. Here's another one from 1957, and I'll highlight the part that I think is really interesting. They're talking about the Champions Liberty stamp featuring the late, uh, the late president of the Philippines, who was, uh, who was, respect, who was respected by, by many in the US as, a, as an anti-communist uh, as, as, as anti leader. And these minutes say the OCB working group on the Philippines would coordinate a draft presidential announcement in connection with commemorative stamp. So the OCB working groups were groups of area specialists drawn primarily from the CIA as well as the State Department. And I think it's interesting that it's suggesting that the announcement of a new stamp series should rather than being written by postal officials should be written by intelligence officers. And it wasn't just champions of liberty stamps that they talked about. Here is one where there, it says that a suggestion by the army was brought up having to do with the possibility of a commemorative postage stamp in honor of the launching of Explorer 1. Explorer 1 was the first US satellite, which came four months after Sputnik. And as a result, Dulles writes, the majority of the board felt it might be unwise to issue such a stamp 
in view of the obvious disparity which now exists between our accomplishments in the satellite field and those of the USSR. So the irony was that because the US didn't, didn't issue a stamp honoring Explorer 1, Poland ended up being the first and Poland was a Soviet allied country. Explorer 1 is, is the purple one. So one of these Champions of Liberty stamps featured a man named Tomasz Masaryk, who uh, was the first president of Czechoslovakia. He helped gain independence for Czechoslovakia after World War II. He helped the country become one of the only democracies in Central and Eastern Europe um, until the country was taken over by the Nazis. Uh, so obviously when this Champions of Liberty stamp came out, the government of Czechoslovakia, which at that time was communist, didn't appreciate these stamps. So much so in fact that they refused to deliver any envelopes that used these stamps. And here you can see two examples, one four cent, which was the domestic rate, and the other eight cent, which was the international rate. And almost every stamp in this series came in both denominations specifically so that they would be used both domestically and abroad. And the embassy of Czechoslovakia wrote a letter to the State Department saying that the US did not issue the stamp to honor Maastricht as, as it had alleged, but to use it as propaganda. To which the State Department replied, that the issuance of stamps as a means of commemorating the anniversary of the birth of honor personages of various nationalities is an accepted international philatelic practice. And I think we can all agree that both of these statements are technically true without perhaps telling the whole story. Now, just seven years after this incident, the US found itself in Czechoslovakia's shoes because Cuba issued these three stamps showing the US using chemical weapons in Vietnam. You can see the gas mask, you can see the dead cattle. The postmaster general asked his, his advisors what he could do about this, uh, including potentially refusing any envelopes that had the stamp on them, the same that Czechoslovakia had done just seven years prior. And his advisor um, wrote back that, well, historically to refuse to deliver the mail is a very severe step. To my knowledge, it has never been done in the United States. And the post office ended up writing a letter to the Universal Postal Union complaining about the stamps. Um, and they first cleared that letter with, with the State Department. Now, there's another way of potentially dealing with stamps that you consider offensive. And that is what one former CIA officer accused the CIA of having done. According to this officer, the CIA found out about this Viet Cong stamp showing a US helicopter being shot down. So what they decided to do was to get a bunch of these stamps, write letters in Vietnamese, use these stamps on the envelopes and mail them to Western news organizations in hopes that some journalist would get a hold of them and write about these stamps and that Americans would get offended. And if this was actually a CIA operation, it was, it was pretty successful because the most popular magazine in America decided to put it on his front cover. And just two days after this magazine issue came out, the Johnson administration published a major policy paper calling for an escalation of the war. So this approach of trying to use a country's stamps against them uh, seems to have caught on. And I wanna show you three clips of President Reagan talking about the Sandinista government in Nicaragua and see if, see if you can spot any patterns. That was 1985. Um, it, I hope that was uh, everyone was able to hear that. If not, please let me know. No, go ahead. We couldn't hear it. You couldn't hear it? Okay. Let me. How did they respond to America's outstretched hand of friendship, trust, and generosity? 
Well, the Sandinistas became, as they had always planned, eager puppets for the Soviets and the Cubans. They created their own Karl Marx postage stamps. Was that a little better? Yes. Okay, perfect. So that was 1985, and this is the year after that. Let's not kid ourselves. The Sandinistas are avowed, dedicated communists. And communists, since the days of Lenin, have advocated terrorism as a legitimate means to attain political ends. Incidentally, Mr. Lenin's picture is quite prominent on new issues of stamps, postage stamps in Nicaragua. And this is the year after that. Peace and democracy, the two are inseparable. And if any one of you think maybe I'm going too far in referring to the Sandinista government as communist, well, I've got some Nicaraguan stamps in my desk drawer in Washington. They carry the picture of Nikolai Lenin. Okay, so these are the Karl Marx postage stamps that he's talking about. And you can see they have little attached images I, again, I hope I hope the uh, my voice is coming through. Yes, you're coming. Okay, loud and clear. Perfect. Uh, so these these are the Marx stamps, and you can see there are little attached images of the Communist Manifesto in Spanish. Now, if one of us had worked as a speechwriter for Reagan, we could have done a little bit of research and and told him that just four months before these stamps came out, uh, Nicaragua had issued these stamps honoring. George Washington. Um, so not exactly the, the smoking gun that Reagan was uh, portraying them as. Um, and these are the Lenin stamps that he also mentions. Uh, Reagan implies that Lenin was, was a popular theme on Nicaraguan stamps. Um, that's not really accurate. These, these were the only two stamps featuring Lenin out of 82 stamps issued by Nicaragua that year. So speaking of Reagan, I wanna talk about one other stamp um, this stamp has to do with the Angolan Civil War, which started in the mid-1970s and, and continued to the early 2000s. Um, the, the main rebel leader, whose name was Jonas Savimbi, um, he, he was fighting against the, gov uh, the, you know, the government of Angola, which was supported by the Soviets. And Savimbi realized that if he portrayed himself as an anti-communist freedom fighter, that he could get the US to formally recognize him. So Savimbi did what every violent and brutal leader does, which was to hire a Washington DC lobbying firm. And the firm that he hired was called Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. If any of those names sound familiar to you, that is because that is Paul Manafort and Roger Stone who's standing next to him. And Savimbi paid them $600,000, which is basically $1.4 million in today's money. And in return, Savimbi was rewarded with a visit to DC to meet with President Reagan and other top government officials. So here's the New York Times article about the visit. And it says that a Florida stamp dealer announced that he had been commissioned by Savimbi to mint and market UNITA freedom stamps. UNITA was the name of Savimbi's organization. And I just wanna point out that this is page A3 of the New York Times. So truly amazing product placement. And these are the stamps that they came out with. So you have a picture of Savimbi in military uniform. You have a black hand shaking a white hand against the flag of UNITA and you have a tiger. So for those of you who don't remember from elementary school, um, this is a map of where tigers live. And as you can see, there are no wild tigers in Angola or anywhere else on the African continent. Um, I think it's pretty clear that no Angolan citizens were involved in the design of these stamps. But the marketers did what they were supposed to. Covers with these stamps were uh, where they had supposedly been postmarked in Jamba, which was the rebel headquarters in Angola. Uh, these were sold at a philatelic exhibition in Chicago later that year. And advertisements for the stamps appeared in, in journals. I, I know it's a little blurry. It says, dramatically drawn Angola freedom stamps signify the fight of the UNITA against an oppressive Marxist government. 
and they're being sold for $15 a set, or you could sign up for a, um, a subscription, a monthly subscription. Now I looked on eBay and as far as I know, only three issues of stamps ever came out. This one, this one with an overprint and some other one. I, I don't know if anyone ever complained if you know they signed up for a monthly subscription, why they only ever got three, but I think it's likely that the people who paid for who paid money for this were less interested in the stamps and more interested in, in supporting the cause. So getting people to accept these stamps as being postally valid was, was still really important symbolically. And they tried to get Republican Congress people to support them. Here is Representative Dan Burton from Indiana. And uh, they had the good luck of having this congressman serving on both the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Subcommittee on Africa, and the House uh, Post Office and Civil Service Committee. So, you know, you're, you're hitting on both of those themes. And he wrote this letter to the Postmaster General asking him to officially recognize unit as stamps. And they even wrote to Reagan asking him to support the stamp. So Reagan staff sent the request to their legal department. And here's a memo called Angolan Resistance Stamps. It's uh, written by someone named John G. Roberts. So if that name sounds familiar to you, that is because that is future Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts. And he said that it is clear neither to me nor to the addressees whether these stamps issued in different denominations are simply a fundraising device similar to Easter seals or if they are intended for use as postage in areas occupied by UNIDA. And what Robert says is that, well, if they're meant as stamps, we don't really know if this organization, you know, if the rebels can actually handle mail, so we shouldn't encourage Americans to use them for that purpose. And if they're meant for fundraising, then Reagan really shouldn't be involved in, in fundraising for private causes. Um, undeterred by all of this, here's a picture of Rousseau giving Reagan a set of the Unida stamps as a gift at a 1988 Republican Party fundraising dinner. And you can just make out the yellow color in, in the middle there. So the last thing I wanna talk about is how the fact that the, the stamp, the fact that the stamp is not necessarily used for postage doesn't make it any less significant as an official document. And nowhere is this clearer than the way stamps are sometimes used on social media. So here is a tweet from India's foreign ministry pointing out how the US was the first country other than India to issue a stamp honoring Gandhi. And as you can see, it was part of the Champions of Liberty series. And it's amazing how almost exactly 60 years later, this pretty simple design can still be a source of goodwill and influence people's perceptions of other governments. Here is a tweet by the, by the ruler of Dubai promoting his country's scientific achievements. And it's interesting that this stamp from 50 years ago was probably more targeted towards stamp collectors than intended for postal use. And 50 years later, it is still helping promote Dubai to a global audience. And finally, here's a tweet from the mayor of Isfahan in Iran. It was in response to news that the Polish government had agreed to host a US conference on Middle Eastern security, which Iran was excluded from and which Iran considered anti-Iranian. And the tweet includes an image of a Polish stamp that was issued in 2008, showing a Polish child standing in front of a Persian rug. It was commemorating how during World War II Iran welcomed thousands of Polish refugees. And the Farsi text, uh, the, the end, end of the, um, the very last sentence says, this is not the way one answers to love. So all of this to say that even though we are using fewer stamps to send mail, the designs on stamps continue to be relevant to politics and international relations. All of these headlines are from just the past four years. So just to conclude, you know, one of the reasons why I and many other people 
collect stamps is, is to learn about history, um, to learn about the people and the events that are depicted on stamps. But the stamps themselves can also be a part of history. Their designs have been discussed at the highest levels of government, and they have even influenced policy decisions around the world. So thank you all for listening, listening to me talk for the last, I guess that is 36 minutes. Um, I'm very grateful for everyone who took time out of their schedules to be here, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you. Fabulous presentation. Thank you so much for all of our friends uh, on YouTube who'll be watching this. It's one of those presentations where the chat box is blowing up. So thank you, that's incredible. I will save my own uh, passion for semiotics for a, uh, a lull in the question. If there is one friends who are on the line, go ahead and use that Q and A box. You've got the the uh, opportunity of a lifetime to speak right now with our presenter. Heidi, so, can I jump in for one quick second? Certainly. I, I just wanted to say I, I will, um, I saw you had kindly uh, put in my email address. I'm gonna just make one small edit to the spelling and I'm gonna retype it so that if anyone has any follow-up questions, or again, want a copy of anything that I mentioned during the presentation, you're more than welcome to contact me. I'd be delighted if I got an email from someone. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure that you will get emails, that's, that's certain. Let's start with our first question. This is, were any US stamps created to send a political message to a specific other country, uh, to specific other countries? If so, which ones? So that, that's a good question. Um, there was one, I'm trying to think, um, I'm trying to think if I can think of other ex examples of stamps. One thing that immediately came to mind was that uh, the US actually had a postmark or, or a, a cancellation that said, support your crusade for freedom. So crusade for freedom was the name of a fundraising campaign for Radio Free Europe. And um, it, it was used on, on a lot of both domestic mail and outgoing mail. Um, Hungary, that when they saw this cancellation, they started returning envelopes that used the cancellation. They, they refused to deliver them um, because they thought that that particular slogan was uh, targeted towards them. And a similar thing actually happened with Canada. Canada had a cancellation that read, why wait for spring, do it now. And what that, when Hungary, when the government of Hungary, the postal officials saw this cancellation, they started refusing to deliver those envelopes as well, thinking that when you say why wait for spring, that spring is, is a euph euphemism for revolution, um, where in fact, what the, what the slogan was trying to say was, why wait for spring to do home repairs? You can just do them in the winter when there are all these carpenters and electricians available. Um, so those are just two examples of times when, um, I guess it was an unintended consequence. Uh, I, I'm not sure they were targeting Hungary in that case. Um, I will, if the person who asked this question wants to email me, I'll send them a copy of the minutes of another operations coordinating board report where Dulles and others were thinking about um, actually creating a postmark specifically targeting Hungary. Uh, the phrase, phrase that they used in the, report, in the minutes was um, a, cancellation, a cancellation honoring the Hungarian fight for freedom. I don't believe that ever came out, um, but it's just, uh, it was definitely something that was on their minds, how to target specific countries. Thank you. Was Russo the dealer in the New York Times article, the fraudster faker, Mark Russo? It, it was it was Mark Russo who is controversial for um, reasons that the the person who's asking this question knows. Uh, you can do a Google search and, and learn all about his history. Um, previously, he had come out with an Afghan resistance stamp, um, which also led to people questioning whether you know whether he's just trying to profit off of stamp collectors or you know what his level of commitment was to the hobby. But the short answer is yes. 
Uh, have stamps been used by USSR or USA with regards to Cuba? That's a good question. I, I don't know of any stamps that um, have specifically been you know, related to Cuba. One thing I will say is that um, when I was putting to, together this presentation, I was thinking about joint issues and the way that you know, the U.S. has sometimes come out with joint issues with some of its, um, some of its, you know, its, its, its rivals. Uh, it issued a stamp, a joint issue with the USSR. It did one with uh, Russia, um, but it hasn't done it nearly enough times. Almost all of its joint issues have always been with allies, and I, I think that's a missed opportunity and, and something that the um, that the Postal Service should uh, should take it, take advantage of. Now, I don't know if, it, it, you know, if you'll know the answer to this, Mateen, but uh, has Trump received any stamp briefings? So this, this question goes to one of the main challenges of this type of research. Um, we, we don't know because these records, you know, most of the things that I showed were from the 1950s and 60s. Um, that's how long it takes for things to be declassified. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of at the mercy of when the intelligence community decides that they want to declassify things. You know, right now, I don't know whether the, the reports that I showed on the screen were the only reports that have ever been written about stamps or if there are hundreds of others. I just, I just don't know because they, you're, again, you're, you're sort of relying on the Historical Review Commission at the CIA to look at these and decide, okay, we're going to release them. Um, the one thing I do know is that all, all U.S. presidents are, are entitled to have their, their face on a stamp. So, um, Trump, uh, President Trump will eventually have a, um, a, a stamp uh, commemorating him and his, his administration. Mm -hmm. So we have two <clears throat> questions that uh, tie into the same topic, Mateen. It, it's, uh, so basically we're talking about the US Champions of Liberty series in the late 1950s, okay? So the entire U.S. Champions of Liberty series in the late 1990, in the late 1950s was issued for political purposes at the height of the Cold War. Also, the 1963 International Red Cross centennial stamp that shows a U.S. ship evacuating Cuban refugees. Very so that, cool. That I'll definitely look a, into that more. That was, yeah, sorry, that was more of a statement than a question. Um, Friends, as I scroll through your, uh, your, your chat, uh, do be aware, I will put also uh, what we're talking about in, in the event that uh, people are unaware, there, this is called semiotics of stamps. So it's the language of stamps. And uh, we had, and I'll put that in the chat box and anybody who is uh, going to watch on YouTube, you, you can find this on our channel. It's James Grayson. And he did a fabulous presentation on the stamps of North Korea, Korea and South Korea, and uh, really is able to tell the North Korean story from the vantage point of the postage stamps. There's also a book called uh, Miniature Messages by Jack Child that goes uh, about the uh, semiotics of Latin American stamps. Uh, one of our attendees, Mateen, uh, is from the UN, you know, he, he's very much into the UN stamps, and he just wanted to let you know that there are several UN, United Nations stamps that have spawned various diplomatic responses concerned with aspects of the design, and he would like to get in touch with you. And I look help. forward to it. Thank you. So, you know, I, I'm curious and, and I, uh, oh, actually, well, I, what, what, what spawned your interest in this? Uh, when did you begin finding the, you know, these breadcrumbs and like, wow, it's, there's a language on stamps being revealed to me. So I was in grad school for international relations and I guess I realized I could kill two birds with one stone. I could learn about stamps and at the same time uh, use that information for, for my research papers for my, for my courses. Um, and at the time I was living in DC, so I, I paid a visit to the National Postal Museum Library and their archives and um, their librarians there are, are fantastic. They um, sat down with me and gave me everything I, I wanted to look through. And it's amazing the amount of stuff that is out there 
that no one has really cataloged in the sense of actually sitting down and, and looking for stamp references. So, you know, you, you might have a file that just says, you know, State Department message uh, regarding Cuba. And then you look at it and you see that it's talking about a stamp and it's, it's you know, no one has seen it in, in decades. Um, and all of that is, is available. It's, it's available if you go to any of the presidential uh, libraries once those uh, once those open up. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to mention was that um, so many of these reports are also available uh, publicly on the CIA's website. Um, you can go and you can do a keyword search for stamps to look at what else is out there. Um, the State Department cables are all digitized. You can look through those. So there, it's become over time. It's it's become so much easier to do this sort of research um, and to kind of look at international relations from an angle that uh, traditionally has, has not been done. Uh, I will just mention quickly one thing. So about two years ago, one of the biggest uh, academic websites for historians called HNET decided to uh, open a separate, uh, a separate page or, or a separate message board focused specifically on postal history. And postal history, not in the sense that a lot of philatelists use it, but postal history in, in the sense of anything related to the mail. And um, I, I actually, I, I believe Scott Tiffany um, at the APRL is on the editorial board. Um, and one of the, one of the um, uh, research scholars at the National Postal Museum um, actually put together a bibliography of academic writing on semiotics, academic writing on, on stamps and their political messages. So you can go through that list, you can Google it, or you can email me and I'll send it to you. But you know, you'll know, you see that over the past, maybe just five, 10 years, um, so many new studies have come out as historians and political scientists realize that stamps can be potentially a source of really cool information, um, a source that traditionally has, has not been, uh, been used to inform their studies. Absolutely. Uh, I've had a couple discussions early on when, when stamps started to be released uh, you know, from COVID and, and what were those messages. Fascinating. What again, uh, Gary Lowe has mentioned that website, but would you mind saying it, repeating it, please? Of course. So it's hnet, so h-net.org. Um, if, uh, if anyone searches H postal history, so H hyphen postal history, it should be the first Google result and it's a really cool website. HNET is basically, um, you can find pages having to do with every subtopic in history. So it has a message board, um, you know, new journal articles, book reviews, job postings, everything you can imagine related to the academic study of history. And the postal history one is brand new. I, I believe it's, it's the newest network um, and uh, it's, it's a very exciting time to be involved in this type, type of research. No doubt, and you're, and you're preaching to the choir here, that's for sure. A couple more questions for you, Mateen, we, or, and, and comments. The Gandhi stamp for eight cents was at, was at a time when first class postage was four cents. Were stamps perhaps issued for values not expected to be used just for the propaganda aspect? So with the Champions of Liberty series, the four cent, most of them were issued in two denominations. The four cent was for domestic use and the eight cent was for international use. So it was expected and hoped that people would use the eight cent variety um, on foreign mail. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't talk too much about the, the Gandhi stamp, um, but it, you know, it, it's actually, it, it has an interesting history um, and it was, it was issued around the time when the U.S. was really um, concerned about the possibility that other countries would fall into the orbit of the Soviet Union, and was really making this push for, you know, public relations with those countries. Um, and I, I believe there are a couple of files at the National Postal Museum Library having to do specifically with the Gandhi stamp and the way that it was um, after it was issued, it was displayed at philatelic exhibitions in India. Um, which again, this was the first time that a country outside of India had issued a stamp honoring Gandhi. 
The P and here's some information for you, Mateen, in case you didn't know, and to our listeners, uh, the PRC, the Pub uh, People's Republic of China, issued a stamp with the map of China. It reads in Chinese, "All the country is red, but the island of Taiwan is in white." It was withdrawn by the post office. Very cool. That sounds like a someone probably got yelled at for for that mistake. <laughs> and a follow up with that information is in 1939, Poland issues a stamp commemorating the 150th anniversary of the US Constitution. It shows George Washington Kane, and I will butcher this person's name, Kichuksko. Washington holds a US flag with 48 stars. And at the time of Washington, the US had 13. Very cool. I love that I can come on a chat like this and, and everyone has, you know, these small bits of information and you can really have a sort of conversation that, you know, in, in my ordinary social circle, I might not be able to have. Um, it's uh, APS members are, are definitely a, a, a fountain of knowledge about the most random topics and it's, it's wonderful to be a part of that network. Oh, that's and and it truly is, and it and it, the hobby where we're learning never ends. That I, I love that. Uh, do you use FOIA to request information? If so, does it work? So I've used it once. Um, I was trying to get a copy of a um, of a, a, a citizen stamp advisory committee uh, record, and I sent it to the post office, and. Um, I, I did not know at the time that actually many of those records had been transferred to the um, to the APRL. And um, when I got in touch with the APRL for the first time, they're like, yeah, we have those. We can, uh, there, I, I believe there's a 25 year um, embargo period where you have to request records from you know over 25 years ago, but they were able to look it up for me. So I, I encourage anyone who is, is um, even for people like me who, you know, think they know a lot. A lot of times, you know, you reach out to librarians and, and you realize how little you actually know and how much they can help guide your, your research, whatever your topic may be. Absolutely. And uh, as, as friends may know, we have the Philatelic Research Workshop online right now. Um, and that'll be available on Classroom C3A. And next month, February 2021, the AP, the American Philatelist, features the topic is philatelic research. So another uh, way to broaden your scope. Do you know of any examples where a government issued a stamp with a message that backfired? So the famous one that I've heard other people say, and I, I think it might've actually been in one of the previous APS uh, stamp chats, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a political message. It was a stamp that said, um, alcoholism, you can beat it. And the recipients of that, you know, of, of envelopes that had that stamp on it um, could potentially be offended that that message was directed at them, that the sender was calling them an alcoholic. Um, off the top of my head, I, I, I I'm sure five minutes after this presentation ends, I'll, I'll be able to think of plenty of political examples, but that's the one, because it's a funny example, that's the one that immediately comes to mind. <laughs> that is, and, I, and that was uh, David Strick Matters. I remember whose presentation that was. What stamps might be used today to influence foreign governments or US citizens? So that's, I mean, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think I, I see it. I see these types of uh, things as as more of an opportunity for governments that they're not taking advantage of. You know, there there are things, there are political messages that you can send that are messages of friendship and and you know, like I said, you know, what what is the harm in doing a joint issue with with an adversary or a competitor as opposed to you know Sweden or the Netherlands or Canada? You know, it's it's cool to have messages of solidarity with your allies, but I, I think I think it would be really cool if if the U.S. you know did a joint stamp issue with with Iran, for example. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a small gesture that you know e even though people, like I said, even even though people use stamps 
less and less on mail, the, the images on stamps are, are, you know, images are as um, emotionally compelling as, as they have always been. And, um, you know, taking advantage of something of that kind of medium for spreading a message of friendship seems to me a no brainer. You know, stamps are the only form of public relations that don't cost anything. Um, the postal service is fully funded through it, you know, what it charges for its own services. It doesn't receive tax dollars. So what other form of public diplomacy can you find um, that doesn't cost you any money and only leads to, you know, people on both sides looking at it and, and thinking good thoughts? Mm -hmm. I love that. It's, and, and, you know, I, it made me go back to, uh, I took a note when you said, you know, their designs have been discussed at the highest level. So yes, the, it's a small gesture, but in fact, you know, the reverberations are exponential. Right. Uh, and before we bid adieu, uh, because people are pouring in with their ideas and I'm sure you on YouTube will continue the conversation by using the comment box. During the congressional debates over where to put a canal across Central America, uh, a Nicaraguan stamp featuring a volcano was used to show the geological instability of Nicaragua versus Panama. Panama was eventually chosen for the canal named after the country. So. <laughs> Very cool. And then another friend has said in the, uh, in, in the chat that in terms of your point with uh, d diplomacy and, and stamps, what a, such a good point, an untapped government resource to be sure. So um, please take a moment, Mateen, and uh, lap in uh, your chat box, which is full of praise. And we see a lot of stamp clubs that want to use this. And we do encourage APS clubs, societies, and all philatelic organizations to, to take advantage of these stamp chats. They are available on stamps.org. They're also available on the APS YouTube channel. If you're looking for a presentation for your online stamp club, or you're looking to uh, to, to start something, well, this is a great place for you. Uh, we've got excellent presentations and this, is, this one is a, an excellent starter uh, to the new year to be sure. Thank you so much. And um, you know, there is a growing desire that I see a, a, among people who enjoy talking semiotics. So perhaps we could talk again, Mateen, and uh, we'd love to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. For sure, thank you. And please everyone join me in thanking Mr. Mateen Madrasi for joining us tonight. We are concluding our stamp chat and we thank everyone for being in attendance and for you watching and sharing this presentation. Today's stamp chat, of course, is brought to you by the APS membership department. Becoming an APS member is just a few clicks away. Just visit stamps.org and apply online. We offer a number of memberships uh, from youth, international and digital only. The APS members has members from around 100 countries and serves to support and connect collectors around the world, just like we're doing here on Stamp Chat. Visit stamps.org and become part of 135 years of fellowship in the hobby. For more Stamp Chat, subscribe to the APS YouTube channel where you will find over 95 Stamp Chats. Um, conversations with philatelists is also available there, presentations from the Postal History Symposium, the Virtual Stamp Show, and so much more. Like and subscribe to that channel and you'll receive notifications of new content. You can also subscribe to the Virtual Philately Newsletter. You can find that at stamps.org backslash news. Scroll to the bottom, subscribe. We can send you a short and sweet newsletter of what's to come in the month. Well, it's time to bid adieu. Uh, don't forget uh, to stay connected. You can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course on stamps.org. Until next time, collect and connect the American Philatelic Society Social since 1886. Thank you so much, Mateen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.